folks. Welcome to 52 Living Ideas. Today, I'm talking about language. Now, when I studied the, the great books of the Western world, we looked at 103 great ideas. And of all these 103 great ideas, this is the idea of language that I found both most fascinating and what I realized that I was not quite equal to actually figuring out what was going on with language because it, it's just so complex, so difficult, I think. And so I have presented in the last four years, I've been doing meetups here uh, in New York City. I've presented on these ideas three times. And I always find that there is a lot more than what I can possibly talk about. So I've decided to do an entire series on language. I did my first one in the series last week. And I, um, if, if you have, um, just uh, in the chat, just let me know if you have either attended that meetup or uh, watched the video. So I kind of know, um, you know how many people have watched it. Um, so what I'm going to do is that now I'm going to go full hog and look at this entire field in great amount of detail. Uh, it's, mostly about, it's mostly about exploring language. Okay, I you know, humbly confess that my, my ability is not equal to this subject. Um, I don't think this, you know, people, we understand, we as a people understand language that well. We understand pieces of it and we think we, every, everybody think, who, who kind of works on language thinks that they have something, but they have, it's kind of like an elephant, they have a little piece of the elephant. So what I want to do today is I want to open up the topics that I see and that are based on this, uh, my reading of the Great Ideas books, just open up the questions. Um, I'm gonna talk, I'm, I have six points to make. Um, and then I'm open, opening up a few questions. And then what I would like to do is that in the discussion groups, we're gonna do breakout groups, talk about you know, what, are, what are questions for you, what are burning questions for you. And we'll do breakout rooms for about 25 minutes and then we're gonna come back and in the takeaway section, identify what two top two questions you have about the nature of language function and nature of language okay so i'm going to present what i know some some of what i know uh, i'm going to raise some questions then i want you to discuss and i want you to come come up with questions of your own of what you think are the most important questions regarding uh, regarding language it doesn't matter if it's the same as somebody else i want your feedback on what um, what you think are the big questions on language. Then on Wednesday, I have a friend of mine, Rob Krasinski, who has been writing uh, for the past 25 years. He writes a lot, so he knows a lot more about language than I do. And I'm going to ambush him with all these qu same questions. I have, so I'm, I'm, I'm already not ambitious. I've, I've given him the questions, but I'm gonna ask him the questions, but I'm gonna have you know, somebody else's take of somebody who kind of works with language day in and day out. Um, and then I'm going to put kind of these questions together and I will build up a series on language on Sundays based on that. Okay, so that's the plan. So let me start. Um, so what is it? Why is it that this topic of language so difficult? I think it's primarily because language speaks to us at many different levels. It speaks to us at an individual level. It speaks to us at, at a social level. You know, it operates at a social, in a social context. It operates at an individual context. Within individual, it speaks to our emotions. It speaks to our intellect. It speaks to our decision-making capability. In the social context, it you know, it speaks to our cultural uh, context. It speaks to our economic context. It speaks to our physical context in terms of kind of finding directions. It speaks in economic context in terms of the economic principles by which we run our businesses. It speaks to the cultural context. And it does all of this simultaneously. 
So for example, when I'm speaking now, I'm taking a whole bunch of physical context as given, you know, I send the Zoom link, the physical link that, you know, you, you would click on to get here. There is the economic context, you know, all of us have the internet, you know, we are able to uh, do, do all of this. Uh, there is the cultural context, there is a shared values that we have between us that is making this conversation possible. In addition to that, there is kind of the emotional context that each of us have. There is a level of curiosity about this topic. There is intellect that we bring to it. There is some understanding we have and whatever I'm saying is relating to that. And then there is a decision-making capacity, the, the will, if you will, um, about why you think this is important and what you're going to do about it. So it's basically, there is communication happening at all these different levels simultaneously. And that is one of the reasons why I think language is complex. So that's the first point, that it is multi-level. My second point is that it is a dialogue. It's not one directional, it is bi-directional. It, it is in multi-directional. So you, it starts at some point, I'm saying something, it is reaching you, you are reacting to it, you're going to speak back to me about it. So even if it's a book, even if it's, uh, it's very clear in spoken language, you know, you speak something and somebody responds and you're, you, you take that in and you speak back. So it, it is, language is formed through a dialogue uh, and it is a dialogue across multiple levels. So you, you are putting something out there and you are getting reactions from it at an emotional level within you, your intellectual feedback when you look at something that you have written and you're trying to um, look at it and kind of, so you're kind of doing a dialogue with your own past writing um, plus you're doing dialogue with other people. So there is a there's tremendous amount of feedback going on. If there is no such feedback in language, then that language is pretty much dead. It's not being used for living. So living language has that level of feedback, which is which is huge. So now I am I call it dialogue. So first first point was that it is multi-level. Second, that it is formed by this massive amount of feedback loops at all levels. Uh, between people, within a person. Um, so I'm calling that dialogue so that there is the phenomena of feedback loop. The third point I want to make, I get from Carl Jung, and that is that language is a mechanism of making more of the unconscious conscious for a short period of time. So it's temporarily making something conscious. It is bring, bringing something in your consciousness. Uh, what was unconscious. You're, you're, by explicating it, you're bringing attention to bear on that. And that's going to last only for a certain period of time for spoken. The, the value of written language is that that period is extended and then that can be shared with people. So it's a way of making things conscious, you know, bringing things into consciousness. So that's another theme. Um, Jordan Peterson's take on that would be uh, in terms of order and chaos. You know, we are in the middle of chaos, which we don't, don't understand. Language is all about forming order out of chaos uh, relentlessly, re relentlessly reordering the chaos. Um, so that's, that's another way of looking, looking at language. So that's my third point of conscious and unconscious. The fourth point I wanna make, I just wanna put down all these points uh, to kind of bring, kind of begin the dis uh, discussion and then we'll take it from there. Uh, the fourth point I want to make is that language is a means of directing your life. Um, it's a way of setting your goals, setting standards for your intellectual um, intellectual pursuits. It's a way of evaluating your emotions. It is a way of deciding what is good in culture. It is a way of deciding what you need to do in terms of business plans. It's It's a way of planning out your physical um, physical um, surroundings. So it's a way of directing your life. It's a, it's a means of directing your life. So it's not like a passive discipline. It's a crucial tool that we have through which we direct our life. So that's, that's a crucial function of language. Um, the fifth point, point I want to make is a very large point. Uh, this is the foundation of the great um, the great books project, great books of the Western world. See, they thought of the entire corpus of all these philosophers, psychologists, novelists, scientists, as they called it the great conversation. Um, 
what does that mean? That means that all great thinkers take in everything that people have said before them in many, many different fields, and then they speak based on that. And so they're kind of adding to the total sum of knowledge. So think of it is think think of this great conversation is the kind of foundational ideas on which the culture and civilization rest. Now that's a very elevated idea. You know, this is like so what the the invitation that Mortimer Adler has is for you to join the great conversation. That means you take in everything that has happened before you, understand it as best as you can, and then speak based on that. And that is the context. So that is kind of part of our language. That is a part of the tools, intellectual tools that we have uh, on which we build. So that is, you know, that's, it's, it's a grand view of what is possible for a human being. Um, so that's, that's, that's the next point, uh, the fifth point I want to make. And the sixth and final point I want to uh, quickly mention is that of, you know, art of expression. And this I learned from uh, Louis Sullivan. So what you need to do is that you take in life. You appreciate life at every, in its all its glory, all its delicacy, all its power, all its forms of growth. You kind of make that your own. And then in your language, in your art, in your work, you reflect that. You, you try to achieve the same level, you know, the kind of power, the kind of flexibility, the kind of adapt adaptability that is seen in nature. So I see language as a tool for doing that. So you see, I mean, I, I'm seeing this as a, as a very dynamic kind of a process. So these are some of my, some of the directions in which I am, I'm exploring language. Now, what I want to do is I want to um, on, on the meetup page, I had put down a bunch of questions about language. So I want to raise those questions. Some of them I have already incorporated in what I've said so far, but I want to put those questions down. And then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to open it up for questions from uh, you folks. Um, at this stage, just ask questions, no comments. What we are doing is that I want to put as many questions on the table. You can do the discussions in the breakout rooms and come back with questions. So today is the time to kind of come up with questions. We will go through all these questions. I'm going to organize all the questions that I get and we will we'll go to the next level next. So, so what I want to do, and, and the reason for not doing comments is that um, what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to basically listen. The way I'm seeing it is that in this Zoom, there are these hundred great thinkers, you know, throughout history, all the philosophers and all the novelists and all the scientists are sitting there and we're trying to do a conversation with them. So I want to kind of operate at a level which does justice to, to this topic. So that's why I'm going kind of in a step-by-step -step process of first trying to get questions on the table and then building up uh, from that. So the kind of questions that I'd raised on the meetup page, this was the result of the last meetup, as well as the, um, um, my reading of the, of the great idea. So I wanna put all those questions down here. Um, so the questions where uh, one of the large questions is the difference between spoken and written language. I'm definitely going to do a full meetup on that. You know, what does writing do? What kind of mental operation, what kind of civilization is possible post-writing uh, versus pre-writing. Um, a gentleman called Julian Chains has uh, amazing things to say about that, and there is a lot more on that. So that's one large question that uh, we will be exploring. Uh, second question that we talked about a lot last time was how do languages grow? And that is very important because it there is a great danger for when you look at some tool to look at it in a static way of just looking at its current state to say, oh, language, it's just there in the dictionary. No, no, no. Dictionary is the dead results of an active process. And you really need to get how that active process works. And only in that context, dictionary makes sense. 
Uh, and so you see what the dictionary is. So you have to get a full grasp of how languages grow, how they interact with one another, how they interact with human life, and how they become rich as a result of it, how they move from different levels. So for example, again, Julian James does a fantastic job of showing how words go from describing physical states like your blood starting pumping to moving from that to having concepts like courage. Um, so uh, so, so we, we're going to explore all of that. Of how, do, how do languages grow? So that's, that's another topic uh, that we're going to look at. Um, next is, the, is looking at the inspiration from science and mathematics and see, okay, what is it that the language of scientists uh, the language of mathematics has achieved, and to what extent can those lessons be taken in and applied across the board to all these levels? So mathematics is focused largely on the physical level, uh, but how do you take that to kind of economic, social, uh, intellectual, uh, uh, you know, emotional level? Um, the next question is that of how do you keep Kind of the coherence of language and clarity of language while keeping it open how does the language remain open to kind of expressing new things grasping new things while at the same time having a system which kind of systematizes everything kind of in a coherent and clear way while remaining adaptable so that's another question that we're going to look at another large question is that of metaphors um, I think metaphors are crit critical, metaphors are analogy. We start with things that we know, starts with, start with patterns that we are familiar with, and then we see the same patterns applying somewhere else which we are not familiar with. And we use that familiarity in one in order to see uh, more about the nature of this new field that we are trying to grasp. And that's a, that's a key part of how languages grow. So that's another um, area we're going to look at. We're going to look at kind of denotation and connotation. Um, you know, initially you start with kind of just vague impressions of things, and then slowly you kind of move towards towards having a more kind of precise uh, formulation of it, and kind of some move, movement from uh, kind of connotation to denotation. Then I want to look at uh, the field of stories. You know, look at uh, what you know about the mythologies and stories and the literary works and see what we can learn about language uh, from that. Um, I want to look at the back and forth relationships between language and culture. Um, to look, at, look at different cultures and different languages and see how, how they flow. Um, I want to look at kind of a larger concept of sign and symbols and see how it applies to language you know see what can we learn from visual arts um, about language or what can we learn from music about language um, those two are kind of broader in a broader sense they are languages um, so what can we learn from visual arts or music about about languages and um, i was planning to do something about computers but i'm going to uh, defer on that because um, because it's kind of that will, I want to kind of focus on the nature of language itself in the human context first, before we go into, into that, because it's very easy to go deductively along wrong ideas over there. So that's why I want to kind of delay the discussion of that. So these are some of the things that I have uh, that I'm, you know, I'm starting out with. And what I want to do is I want to have uh, you know, have you asked some questions and I will just make some brief comments about it and I'll keep track of all the questions and go from there. So uh, now is the time for questions. Uh, you can ask your question by either typing the question in the chat or putting exclamation mark or raising your hand in Zoom. Please keep your uh, questions as brief as possible so we can, uh, at this stage, we're trying to look at the breadth of the idea. Uh, you know, breadth of this field. Um, so uh, it's going to be James followed by Joe. James, go ahead.
Uh, okay, uh, I can go ahead and James, uh, I can just read out your question. The question is, what is the relationship between language and consciousness or thinking? I mean, that's a very, very good question. I think that's a key, um, you know, a key question. So one of the things is that language is explicit. Um, you know, when you're talking about something, you are, you know, consciously focused on that. Um, the, 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 the term of consciousness is, is, a, is a tricky term. Um, I mean, the way in which um, I would, you know, I would, I would start with Jung, I would look at kind of the unconscious as, I mean, I would include kind of both of kind of what we don't know about the world, as well as what we don't know about ourselves as a kind of part of something that you're not aware of at, at the given time. And the way I see it is that the language has the capacity of putting spotlight on something and to make it known. And then it has these mechanisms of using words to capture it so it gets into your memory. So it is kind of using the conscious capability that you have at a given moment to store up the results of your acts of consciousness in a way where next time around, you can access it faster. You can get there faster. Uh, it will still go in memory. It will, you will not be conscious of it at that point of time. But when you come to it, you will say, ah, I remember that I... So it's, it's a very interesting play between uh, language uh, in a sense. I mean, this is just so, so fascinating. There are so many connections here. Looks like it's a tool which leverages your ability of, con of, of being conscious, which is a very precious resource requiring a lot of effort. It leverages it into this... Um, symbols, which are um, audio uh, and visual, or, you know, audio symbols in spoken language and visual symbols in which kind of store up the results in an organized way so that your, all your future uh, thinking is, is uh, more powerful. Um, Joe, you had a question. Joe, go ahead. Yes. Is there... Um... A, I mean, there, the book speaks to this, but is there a correlation to the improvements in language and the improvements in science? And building on that from uh, George's question last week, if there are paradoxes in language, then what's the linkage between science and the paradoxes that were uh, that are you know seemingly in a uh, uh, that are in a language? Okay, um, I'll take the simple version of that. I'm trying to kind of keep uh, the complexity at the, I'm just kind of trying to take large themes at that time, uh, at, at this time. So let's look at uh, science. So firstly, science is relatively new. Language is much older than that. So there is a lot of things that have happened in language before science. Um, and those are, you know, completely, you know, very useful attempts, whether it is in form of kind of mythology and religion, then in form of philosophy that try to get at, you know, use language in order to grasp, you know, human existence. Um, science, um, I think as best as I understand science, it is, it is focused on measurement. It is focused on kind of increasing the level of precision of what you're doing. It starts out with the physical world. Um, and, you know, people like Galileo are the giants over there. And, you know, his quote is that book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. Um, and then from that, you know, people keep building. Then there is Darwin who uses, you know, that is science, but he's using kind of regular language to do that. There isn't that much mathematics in what he's doing, but he's systematically organizing, carefully organizing all the information in a far more systematic way than, so there is something to do with kind of systemat systematization of organization that is, that is part of science. Um, and many of these things we can learn from these and kind of apply some of the lessons to how we think about, about everything. Uh, but there are limitations of, you know, what is it that you can measure in terms of, you know, effort that you're taking in being conscious? What kind of measurement is possible in that as compared to um, measurement of 
uh, movement of planets. Uh, so there is kind of differences in measurement. So I think there are some lessons that can be learned, but they have to be applied in some, there is a, ten, there is a, there is a temptation to kind of just try to copy science directly, but that just like Darwin couldn't just copy uh, Newton, he had to figure out what, what applies to his field. We have to do that for whatever field of humanities that we are, we're working on. All right, so there are amazing number of questions. So I'm just going to uh, go, uh, folks, this is almost like a quick, like a romp through this topic, but don't worry, I have going to, I'm going to listen to all, everything that, uh, that is coming up, uh, all the questions very carefully, all the answers very carefully. I'm going to keep organizing them and I'm going to keep doing meetups on all the key themes, okay? So, uh, so next up is Alexander. Alexander, go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, I, I was just wondering um, uh, there, um, what are we actually expressing with language? Uh, I mean, on the physical level, we have sounds uh, that meet our ears, but of course, uh, we all know from just listening to you now that there is much more to it than just the uh, physical uh, transactions. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, great question. I, I think uh, the thing that makes language very difficult is that things are happening at multiple levels at the same time. So you're hearing the sounds, um, you are, there is, it's going, it's going to have impact on emotions. It is going to engage your capacity of reasoning. It is going to, it's going to be a social uh, phenomena of, of another person talking to you. And it is a part of kind of social interaction. It is, it can be a part of the, uh, economic inter interaction. So, so many things are happening at the same time. Um, and the thing is that it's a very rich tool. So it is very easy to abuse it as well. You know, you can very simply like, just like a computer can be used as a doorstop or it could be used as a weapon <laughs> if you want, uh, but it remains a computer. So, so I find that people use language in all kinds of ways, but it, the way I'm, I'm trying to do, uh, I'm trying to approach is to, to see What's the, what's the grandest way? What's the most fundamental use of language? What is the range of its power? I want to map that out. So that's the approach uh, that I'm taking. Um, Ed, you had a question. Ed, go ahead. Yeah, um, for the value of learning dead languages, uh, such as <clears throat> Latin, uh, Attic, Greek, uh, I think there is quite a, a value in uh, sure. these. Sure. Um, very good. Um, so I would say there are a couple of things. Um, I, I would contest the issue of it Latin being a dead language because its parts survive very well, thank you, in, in, uh, in my language. And I think that kind of knowing the roots of where, uh, where these languages came from and what they are, um, so, the, so there are many, many different values. I mean, I, I look, at, look at it in a kind of an evolutionary context. You know, I look at kind of evolution of culture and I see uh, evolution of language as being parallel to that. And to see, for example, English owes such a large debt to Latin that you can actually trace Latin in that. You can also, you can see the value of it in terms of understanding kind of you know, Roman history, or is, even if you take a language which is completely gone and it has no, um, no progeny left, uh, you can understand the culture that used that language only by understanding that. So, so they, but that's a much more limited use. Um, this, uh, but something like Latin, because it is arrived, or Sanskrit, uh, because it is alive in its progeny of languages, uh, it's it's very useful to know because then you can actually, for example, my my Marathi actually is better than my English in that sense is that I can trace roots. So when I see a, say a Marathi word, all the parts of it immediately all the roots are apparent to me. So I can actually go and flow. Oh, this is where it came from. This was like the lotus over here, and this is like a s metaphor from where this. Uh, this particular um, word came from. And that's very, very powerful because you can see how the language, uh, language developed. Uh, John, you had a question. Well, I'm just you know, presenting a question for discussion. Poetry is a distinctive form. 
and poetry has many interesting characteristics, uh, not only in terms of song and in terms of performance, in terms of live speech, in terms of multiple meanings that even single words can have. So there's room for uh, a whole a whole topic area around that. Absolutely, absolutely, and we'll, we'll definitely do that. I mean the um, I mean the general field of um, kind of you know kind of fiction myth. Um, uh, kind of novels is kind of one large part and within which I think poetry takes a special uh, special role because it is so concentrated and it uses this, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like concentrated story uh, that uses both kind of, you know, the sounds and the rhythm to create uh, kind of very powerful emotional impact. So uh, it's, it's a great way to look at kind of the, emo, especially the emotional aspects in you know, like em, emotional powers of language. I think that's, that's a, it's a good place to look at it. So what I expect is that like over time, we'll, we'll be taking all of these topics and we'll take science and say, okay, what kind, what can we learn about language from science? Then we'll take something like a poetry and say, okay, what can we learn from language, from poetry and how, and what I suspect is that there are going to be lessons that can be picked up from that and be applied across the board. Because I know like some, some good speakers, their speech is poetic in the sense that that is kind of built into how they speak. They have somehow managed to integrate that. So, so there is, uh, it's, it's very rich. Thank you. Um, next up is um, Rebecca. Rebecca, go ahead. Hi, sorry. Um, yes, um, my son communicates with the letter board and he'd like to know uh, if this is still language and is, is beyond just like yes, no, or uh, simple um, questions. He uses it to uh, communicate um, paragraphs and to uh, explain his art and uh, the world around him. So, and of course he, you know, he makes sounds, which I don't know if that's language too, but he wants to know if that's still communicating, is that still language? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the language, I mean, that's another thing I'm going to look at. Um, that's uh, the whole field of, you know, how did language come to be? Uh, because it's, it's a very long story, you know, because kind of looking at it in the evolutionary context of how did we get here? Right. I mean, there is kind of, uh, I mean, we do have a quite complex voice box that allows us to make a very wide range of sounds. Um, plus, we have a way of kind of, we have kind of necessity of coordinating with one another. So we can, you know, I'm going to go back and kind of look at, you know, how did, how did we end up having language in the first place? And um, Language as a concept is a much larger concept. I mean, communication is a much larger context. So, for example, you have imagine like a uh, you know um, uh, airport where people are using all kinds of signs in order to communicate with one another, and that's a very crucial amount of communication going on, and that is done by by signals. Uh, so, so all of that is kind of part of uh, communication or language. Uh, Francois, see you're next. Yes, um, uh, my question is about the Esperanto. You know, at the beginning of the century, there was that uh, trial to create a global language. And there was a lot of effort uh, to see how by creating a common language between all people, we would get something, you know, to, to communicate between everybody. And the whole experience kind of failed. So I'm wondering why did it fail? You know, is there, is it, did it fail forever? Is it something which failed because of, uh, you know, it was not done properly? There's still hopes that one day we have a common language. Uh, what do you think of that Esperanto? Um, okay, I, 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 cannot, I cannot resist this, uh, Francoisie, but uh, let, let, let me say it, it failed because somebody else succeeded. Um, I, I, I think, I, th I think language is a living thing. Um, if you try to kind of come up with, you know, dream out some kind of a platonic ideal language that nobody uses, 
that everybody is supposed to be using just doesn't work. Language is not like that. It's a tool that human beings use. So there is a lingua franca, which is English now. Uh, so what happens is that uh, each language has the opportunity of becoming a language like that. And what has happened is that in English has won out uh, of being far more responsive, far more um, kind of ready to take in things from other languages, making it um, very easy. So, so uh, it's like the, 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 the the experiment succeeded with with uh, English oh. winning out. Next one up is Mike. We, uh, Francois, we are trying to just cover a whole range of areas. But what I'm saying is that language is organic, and its yeah, yeah, no, I success, understand. its success or failure, you. was is based on that. Mike, you're next. Okay. Several questions hang off of the fact that I can have a concept in my mind that I completely understand, but it takes several. Uh, several pages and uh, and several weeks even to convert it into words. Sure. Let um, me let me address there's that. A, there, there's a concept of measure in terms of data or information of entropy. Uh, for knowledge, or um, uh, is there a, uh, there's a lot of work on similar concepts for knowledge, and uh, I all this ties together into several questions that are floating in my mind. Absolutely. So, uh, so Mike, what I suggest is that in the breakout rooms, talk to people about all of this, and then come back in the takeaway section and ask one question that I will put as a uh, as a question to be included. Uh, in, in this one. This is very, very interesting because what happens is that, I mean, that, that's, that's really, I mean, it's, okay. Um, so what I want to say is that this is true because what, what happens is a concept, a well, a powerful concept is actually an integration of a lot of data and a lot of observations into one thing. And to fully grasp the context, a lot of inductive work has gone into it. So in order to support that context inside your own mind, you've done all of, all of that work. Once you've done all of that work and that has become that has become almost a part of you, you can use it almost instinctively at that point. And that's the whole purpose of it. But when you want to communicate it to somebody else, you have to unfurl everything that went into kind of producing that context and how it is being used. So there is a you know, there is that kind of, um, you know, kind of bringing together uh, from from everything and then going out again across people that that happens. Uh, Loy, uh, you're next. Loy, go ahead. Okay, uh, next one is, let me see, uh, Alexandria. Alexandria Lee, go ahead. Uh, you need to unmute. Okay, next yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Here, here. Uh, my question is, how does the body language enhances the speaking language versus uh, a written language? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, that's a huge, huge thing. I mean, um, like people have looked at when there is spoken communication, something like, I don't know what the percentages are, but 60 to 70, 80% of it is kind of body language. Maybe 60% is body language. Maybe 20% right. is tone. And yeah. the actual conceptual mm -hmm. context is, uh, is very little on the top of that in mm -hmm. uh, person to person uh, communication. So body mm -hmm. language is definitely a part of it. But at the same time, there are limitations to body language. So for example, mm -hmm. you can't use body language um, in order to come up with a contract between people. right, right. Yeah. Uh, so, so there is like there, mm -hmm. there is uh, there, there is a base. So, so that's another thing. I'm you know we're going to look at in great detail about how does kind of spoken communication work and how does written communication work. And okay. like for example, uh, this kind of body language is crucial in um, establishing kind of closeness of social relations. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
there is, so what I'm saying is that each of those things have limits and there is okay. kind of scalability that is there mm -hmm. for okay. the spoken language and then the mm -hmm. written language, which is at a completely new scale. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so next one up is, let me see, Brad, let me see, Brad, do you have a question? Brad P. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't really a question. I was just thinking in terms of uh, language and science and, um, and, and how science is its own language, right? That seems to be a subset of, um, of, of the total of language. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the, um, this uh, great books program, like the mm -hmm. Syntopicon that I was reading, that includes mm -hmm. scientists. So some of the most interesting things uh, that people have said about languages are from scientists. People like Lavoisier, mm -hmm. uh, Descartes, Newton, um, uh, Darwin, I mean, they actually understand language. And I have a, you know, I've, I have a science background. I'm a, you know, with technology and I have mm -hmm. profound respect for the scientists because they are the most systematic and most careful of thinkers. Yes. Uh, so there is a lot to be learned from, from language, from these folks. Um, I think the heart of kind of what science has to offer or mathematics is measurement. Kind of you know careful kind of measurement, being able to kind of come up with uh, kind of units of measurement and systematically doing all kinds of measurements and in an integrated fashion, um, and doing that you know kind of rigorously uh, and insistently. So that's something, uh, and I think there is a lot that can be learned from that. But the interesting question is always how to kind of take these tools and apply it to human human things, you know, how do you bring it into psychology? How do you bring it into sociology? Uh, you know, things like that. So that's something that I, I look forward to discussing in great amount of detail. All right, uh, next one up is uh, Franny. Franny, oh, Franny says, read for me. Um, when did language go from explaining the world for survival means to broadening into expression, expressing ideas creatively uh, and expression of feelings? Uh, how did that further uh, evolve? So, so it's like, um, I mean, it partly, what, what shall I say? I mean, it, it's just kind of Maslow's hierarchy. I don't think uh, there was ever a time, I think feelings were always important, uh, whether we were in a, even in a kind of hunter-gatherer tribe, kind of communication of feeling and expressing ideas um, would be there to some extent. Um, and uh, so it's just a question of you know what, how much, uh, how much effort or how much time a particular person spends on that, and I think that's kind of Maslow's hierarchy of whatever is made possible. I think kind of the higher levels kind of rest on the lower levels and make kind of a new integration possible, something like that. Um, so it's like you know, as as we progress, you know, for example, the amount of art that we consume will keep on increasing, um, you know, things like that. Um, James from Portland, does not each science have its own language? Uh, yes, um, but I think there are kind of commonalities between language, which, um, so th th that's another that's very, very interesting question. I want to look at it as a broader thing. Um, yes, languages are different from one another, but what we are trying to see is um, kind of, you know, what is the commonalities between languages? What is it? how are they languages in that sense? You know, what can we learn from the language of, for example, let's say music, what, 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 what can we learn from that? Um, so yes, each of the science has its own language. I would say they have their own concepts. I wouldn't say that they have their own language. They have different concepts and different laws. Um, when did the language move from spoken to written and the spoken expression? I think this is a huge question. Um, as best as I know, I mean, this is kind of, this is part of anthropology. Um, it seems like a lot of things happened at the same time. Um, I think it's around 5,000 BC or, or 10,000 BC, somewhere around there, where there are first cities, advent of agriculture, advent of writing, uh, advent of institutions like, um, like um, monuments, things like that. So this is all kind of came with the first cities like Chital Huyuk, you know, in uh, Sumeria 
uh, all those cities. And that time, the first advent, first use of writing was in accounting, actually, uh, of, you know, when uh, the agriculturists, the farmers brought their crop to the granary, they were given a baked receipt, which had the number of bushels that they brought in and what they brought in written, uh, which they could take uh, with them. So when it came, uh, came time in winter to kind of get back uh, grain from the granary, they would say, oh, look, this is what I, I got. So something like that. So, so I think there is a lot of things. Uh, so writing is very tightly uh, connected with the advent of civilization because um, we evolved in a tribe of about maybe 30 people or so. So going from that to learning to deal with 5,000 people in a city, you need more structure. You need kind of things that you can take for granted. So uh, religions were was another thing that came at the same time. So there is a whole constellation of new things that happened, including writing uh, at that time. So this is kind of a very quick um, kind of impressionistic uh, look at language. Now, what I want to do is I want, I want to do the breakout groups. Um, so you get, you get to kind of talk out your ideas in a much more free form. And then let's come back in 25 minutes and just focus on the big questions. What are the big questions you think are critical questions on language, okay? Um, if you can't put it down to two, you can go up to three, okay? And what, what I'll do is that I'll I'm gonna compile all these questions and formulate how we are going to do discuss. Symbol. Yes, which is a form of symbolic. All right, language. folks, uh, <laughs> so welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, so now it's time for takeaways. Um, we've covered a lot of, lot of area. So one of the things I do want is those two questions um, from, from each of you. But also if you want to spend, you can spend two to three minutes talking about your take on language and um, what, what you got from the meetup and what, what, do you, what do you see yourself getting from this series? Um, or you know your, your take on language and the two questions. So I'm just going to uh, go in the order in which I see people. Um, let me see. First one is Ed. Ed, go ahead. So Ed followed by Christian, followed by Francoisi. Ed, go ahead. Uh, just a second. Uh, Ed, we can't hear you. Go ahead. It's language versus, com uh, com okay, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, go okay. ahead. What constitutes language and what constitutes communication? Like animals can Is it like a survival thing? Uh, Rolando, just hold on. Hold on for a second. We, we uh, speak in turn. So right now it is um, Ed speaking. Go ahead. Um, Animals can communicate, but it is, it is, a, is it language? Whales have a, a communication technique, but would you say that that is a language? Okay. And um, then the origins of written language, uh, obviously a verbal language came first, and how um, written language formed uh, initially from uh, the uh, oral. Okay, very good. So, uh, very good, I've noted those. Uh, Christian, so Christian followed by Francoisi. Uh, you can make comments about language and you can ask, uh, you can put, put on your table, put on the table two questions that you think are the biggest questions on language in your mind. Christian, go um, ahead. Okay, uh, so one question that I was thinking about was, um, so I studied abroad and I was studying Spanish and um, I saw that there were a lot of variations of Spanish in different countries in Latin America. And I wanted to ask, uh, like, what are the or like how, I don't know how to phrase this question, but how have these variations come about? Like, was, is it the geographical location or um, the different variations in culture. And yeah, that's, that's my main question I wanted to ask. Okay, excellent. I mean, what we'll do is that we'll kind of uh, ha handle the kind of the large version of it. 
like for example, uh, I don't remember the name of the gentleman, but he was a Britisher uh, in 19th century who was the first one to discover actually the concept of families of languages, like the Indo-European family, where he kind of saw that there were similarities between languages and uh, he looked at, you know, how do kind of dialects of different languages develop versus how do different languages develop from another. So we'll put that, I'll put that as kind of development of language. Uh, Christian W, go ahead. Yeah, so one question we discussed in our group and which I'm also personally interested in is the, is the value of formal and grammatically uh, correct language uh, versus sort of popular common language which has less precision and, and also in this question relates to the value of, of slang, foul language, mm -hmm. so forth. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, next one up is Francoisi. Um, okay, so we realize, you know, how vast is the subject, but um, uh, we were considering about grammar, you know, and how the expression of grammar differ from one language to another uh, by importance. Mm -hmm. uh, and also how um, some um, remote culture, like we were talking about the Hopi Indians, mm -hmm. who don't have that sense of uh, past, present, and future, and their thinker, their th way of thinking was more circular, so they didn't need to express the time in mm -hmm. their language. That was making them very, very different. And for other ways, you know, the, the way the Chinese, the French, the Spaniard are expressing their grammar in different way, and how the, the, the right, you know, would decide what's right and wrong in the way you express yourself. Okay, so we'll put as that as uh, kind of looking at kind of grammars across across right. different languages. And okay, so it's going to be Alexander, Larney, and Franny next. Alexander, go ahead. Yeah, Frost was all, already expressed most of it in from what we discussed in our group. It was really interesting to see uh, the the Hopi uh, culture uh, today and and have this example as an ancient language compared to our language today. And maybe it gives us some pause to make assumptions about use of language as we do it today and say, oh, or just assume that they use the language in ancient time the same way. I think uh, it should give us pause and be careful uh, with such assumptions. Okay, uh, do you have questions uh, in terms of questions about language that interest you most? Well, what's the purpose of language? That's okay. the most interesting okay. question. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, next up is uh, Lar Larni, followed by Franny, fo followed by Ludmila. Larni, go ahead. I don't know if I have a uh, question as much as an observation. My interest is in how language affects our thinking. Mm -hmm. the, uh, it, it expands it and it limits it. And if in, in a strange way, if you can control the language, you can control the people. Mm -hmm. And in our present day culture, that seems to be an unlimited type of freedom through our technological landscape. And there's a part of me that's beginning to wonder, is this good or bad? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this total freedom of anybody to say anything they want out there online. And what is it doing to our democracy? What is it doing to our thinking? Um, and, and the idea that there, there is pre-linguistic thought. You know, I, I keep thinking okay. Picasso had to like transcend his language to get to, to the, uh, the other type of thinking. And I think we all on some level have to transcend the language of the culture we were born into. Otherwise, we're controlled by it whether we realize it or not. Just like we're controlled by the technology and whatever else is in our environment. Thank you. Thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Franny followed by Ludmilla, followed by Michael. Franny, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we did talk um, a, lot, a little bit about um, cultural and cultural differences in learning a language and um, some of the ways that, um, well, my interpretation would be how deep uh, emotionality 
is that harder than learning just the basics of what a language is? And yes, it was expressed by Christian actually that it was harder to learn the emotional piece and how to express that than some of the others. So I've been very interested in just language in general, just how do you, what is the differences between just expressing commonality in day-to-day -day living and that whole idea of expression and societal changes that can be made, which is another thing that we talked about through dialogue and through uh, vocabulary and lifting the vocabulary. And Deborah helped with that. She was great. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Ludmila followed by Michael. Ludmila, go ahead. Uh, so I would formulate my, formulate my question is, uh, can mathematics be considered as extension of uh, human language? And one of the reasons why I have this question because I work, work in physics and in physics, uh, it, it happened long ago when people could not really explain why the particle can be particle and wave at the same time. They just say, okay, look at the formula, Schrodinger equation, it's clear from there. And this showed limitation of our regular equation and need of mathematics really to express what we want to say. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm going to do a whole meetup on kind of science, mathematics, and language. So that's that's a very large large topic. Definitely, we'll we'll do that. Uh, Michael, you're next. Yes, I've been thinking about two things specifically. The first one being that creativity and progress mm -hmm. are the primary catalysts for finding more precise language, which will then focus force us to create new language. And okay. the second point is that body language enhances spoken language, but it rarely appeals to the intellect. It serves to keep attention by appealing to the emotions. And in some instances, body language and charisma will compensate for the message's substance. Yes, that's excellent. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, John Roth, Loy, and then Rebecca. Uh, John, go ahead. We didn't talk about this a lot in my group. Uh, you know, other people had wonderful things to say. My question is, um, what can be understood about the relationship between memory and language? Not only individual personal memory, but shared collective cultural memory. Mm -hmm. So that's a big, huge topic and it, it can stand on its own when, yes. if, if there's a time for that. Yes, excellent, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Loy, followed by Rebecca, followed by James. Loy, go ahead. Okay, um, I'll continue with what Lenny say, say. We, we were in the same group, and something that pops up in my mind is that the, the how language, both as a natural evolution, and also how is it limited by the powers that be to, to make the culture change, to make the, to make the language suit a certain ideology. Uh, I seen this how the Chinese language changed under communist rule. Okay, <laughs> and I have a question. Two questions that are quite related. One is how the language, how languages evolve in our lifetime that we observe, and how was it, and those that were evolved through historical times, like. Over historical time, I find that the languages, all languages are much more compact than the modern lang modern con uh, counterpart. Like you, like, so I just, why it become um, less concise mm -hmm. uh, and compact? Yeah, I mean, what we'll do is that in the theme of kind of growth of languages, we will look at all of that. Uh, of saying, okay, how do, how do languages change? You know, how, how do they kind of expand? How do they contract? We can look at also, you know, things like um, written scripts, like what Korea did of kind of simplifying the, the alphabet, uh, you know, kind of relations, you know, we'll look at kind of different kinds of languages, like, um, like the Chinese, the fact that it has, you know, at the written level, it has like this 
tens of thousands of alf you know alphabets whereas we have just 26 uh, and what's the difference in in the language so we'll, we'll look at all of that uh, next one up is rebecca followed by james rebecca go ahead um one of the things that that um i i want i took away from our um uh, our our group was um the acquisition of language and uh, some of the things that, that we uh, discussed was um, learning um, English through watching uh, television, um, grammar, uh, structure of language, um, vocabulary, and colloquialism, and um, swearing. So where does that come in for acquisition for a for complete language, for complete uh, structure and uh, communicating. Thank you, thank you. So what I'm going to do is that I have an item here for how do you improve your language? Uh, and I'm, I'm going to include all of that because it's not just that, because it's like, that is just to kind of get you started on language, but things like, for example, reading of literature, I think is critical to kind of making your language rich enough. So it's a kind of, how, how do you improve your language? And I think, uh, I strongly think that writing is a crucial part of improving your language. You can't really read well, you can't really master a language well until you learn to write because that gives you the feedback of you using the language, you kind of looking at what language you're using and then improving on it. So just the, uh, the entire field of how do you improve your language. Uh, so it's going to be next, uh, James, uh, followed by Joe, followed by Brad. James, go ahead. Yeah, so first off, I'm just really grateful for all the questions that are coming out. I'm fascinated by the multifacetedness of, of, of the questions. Um, so one question that's coming up for me now is the relationship between language and, and the word. You know, the concept of the word is logos, or, uh, or if you think of in the Bible, in the beginning was the word, and the word was the God. The creative, the creative word, mm -hmm. creativity that, you know, is in what way can language be a creative act? Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, um, I will definitely, definitely look at that. I mean, uh, Jordan Peterson has, does, has uh, some very interesting things to say about that, but we'll definitely pursue that. Uh, so Joe, followed by Brad, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we had a great discussion. I learned a lot, uh, and it's, it's you know it's hard to get your head around so many different topics. But the uh, some of the questions that we came away with was you know what is the relationships between words, numbers, and reality? Um, because when words don't act, or when numbers don't act accurately depict reality, then words can come becomes incendiary. So think about it in just an economic terms. If the economic and you're telling everybody you're great, but it doesn't reflect reality, then the words can come in with rhetoric to then uh, distort the numbers. So it's that relationship that was interesting. And then another one was how power structures actually influence language uh, and, you know, uh, specifically the male influence of language on language and the ramifications associated with that. Uh, and then the last question I had thought about was just, uh, you know, what, how do we reach a decision on what confers meaning out of sounds and symbols? I mean, you know, just that process. And what is that relationship advancements in the, that specific area, which is language, relate to reasoning? Mm -hmm. and how it really relates to rational thought um, and how certain uh, necessities uh, may actually help languages become uh, fully expressive or more expressive. I want to say fully, nothing's fully expressive, but more expressive. So um, those are the main takeaways. I have a lot of other thoughts that are going through my head, but I just haven't had a moment to organize them. So thank you. Wonderful. Though. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is Brad, followed by C, followed by Alexandria. Brad, go ahead. Well, I suppose that, that my thought is that um, society has been called an expressive totality. 
And, and it is, and it is an expressive totality, not only through culture and activity, but I would say primarily through language, right? And so, and so then I also think of Jung and the collective unconscious of this, of this expressive totality. And, um, and can, can any group, so my question is, can a group, even the majority, completely co-opt a language in this, in this expressive totality, in this collective unconscious of everyone within a system. So, and if, it, if it's possible, then what would the evidence be or what would the evidence be to the contrary? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, I mean, kind of the general topic that I'm going to uh, deal with is the question of kind of language and society. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. you know, we'll, we just put that as a topic and then, you know, put a whole bunch of kind of subtopics under that. So that's, that's what I'm thinking of doing. Um, next one up is C followed by Alexandria followed by Deborah. C, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I, I was, uh, Joe described a bunch of the things we talked about, but I was interested specifically in the way we use language to talk about art mm -hmm. and um, the way it, it frames the way we think about art and then also the way we use, um, the ways that art just speaks without language. So like mm -hmm. art as a language of, unto itself. Right. What I'm going to do for that is that I'll do like one section on visual arts and music and its connection with uh, with language. Uh, because uh, like, for example, because that this point is much wider because it's not just in the field of art. For example, engineers use diagrams all the time. Science uses diagrams all the time in order to capture relationships. And they that is very effective way of capturing relationships um, as opposed to just language, uh, just opposed to kind of, you know, writing things out. Uh, so that whole thing. And then uh, looking at music also as, as a part of that. Uh, next up is uh, Alexandria followed by Deborah followed by Sunshine. Alexandria, go ahead. Sure. Um, my question, my two question is, first one is, I like to understand what are the factors that uh, influence the, uh, the direction language has evolved. Um, my second question is about the dialect. Now, for instance, I mean, in India, in China, there are a lot of dialects, especially in India with, the, with different dialects. They have like 50 different dialects and with different writings. How, um, why I mean, over the years, it, it, seems to be you know why it didn't converge um in the in the region you have all those um language that's still very much alive what are the what are the underlying underlying needs maybe driven the fact that they, that they still exist in this day so that's what i like to understand yeah, and i want to make a mm -hmm. comment about michael's comment in, with respect of the body language that I earlier that I asked. I generally agree. I think body language, as you said, it doesn't appeal to the written language, but it enhances emotion. However, with um, the modern technology, seems like, you know, I mean, the, I mean, the time that there's a, the need to use, um, to write a letter to um, even, even with, a, even with a, as a card, seems like a diminishing. Oftentimes, we just jump on the screen, we talk directly, we mm -hmm. pick up the phone. So in this case, I mean, does that um, place more weight on the speaking language? I mean, of course, the, I mean, um, yep. there's a, right, a written language, there's always a critical importance for the written language because we need to pass on the knowledge. But since, you know, contemporarily, presently, the speaking language seems to be very, um, it, it's booming. Mm -hmm. um, next up is, uh, so on, on this one, what I'm going to do is that on the, on the dialects, I mean, in the uh, section, I'm going to do a meetup on kind of growth of language, kind of evolution of language, how language is spread. Um, I think India is a very good example of this kind of explosion of, I mean, there are like 26 or so major languages, each of which have probably 10 to 15 dialects. So wow. we're talking about 200, you know, 200 plus dialects. Wow. And um, it kind of reflects the complexity of the society and how the society is structured. 
uh, that the people who speak a particular dialect. Um, so, so there is a correspondence between culture and language. So that's something that I would, I would like to look at. Uh, next up is uh, Deborah followed by Sunshine. Deborah, Hello. Hi. Yeah, I think initially you asked about the definition of language versus the word communicate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so I was saying language is a representation of ideas and concepts. And then to communicate, um, I wrote that's used to share ideas and to connect with other people. That's Got how it. I distinguish the difference. Got it. And um, so in our group, uh, we had a really great discussion. And um, boy, we talked about everything. But um, I was arguing that we have a need for a steady increase in knowledge and vocabulary in order to express our ideas and to grow and to be able to think critically. And there are so many implications for that um, as a society and how successful we are or not. And so my question to go with that, mm -hmm. um, because I think there's a, a massive need in the United States to uh, insert some intellectualism and humanity and communication and critical thinking skills into every aspect of society. But anyway, so my question is, how can we encourage people in the United States to step up their acquisition of knowledge and critical thinking skills and to embrace their natural curiosity? Because we're all curious. Why do some people choose never to read a book again? They'll say, oh, I don't have to do math anymore. I don't have to read a book anymore once they graduate. And that is, as a teacher, that is like, ah, oh, that's something that I really desperately want to change about our society. Wonderful. I, uh, you know, I could, uh, I could not agree uh, more with you. I mean, that's what uh, my meetups are all about. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I've not been able to kind of kindle that kind of curiosity in people. But um, mm -hmm. the one thing that I'm able to do is that when people come with some curiosity, I can, then I can put them all together and make sure that that curiosity is fueled and it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, it kind of bounces off one another. And um, so that's something uh, that's huge. And the other, other part, point I do want to say is that, um, you know, language is not static and it is dynamic and it is the, the progress of civilization is the progress of kind of expansion of knowledge, expansion of language. Uh, one of the critical parts and kind of requirements of it is to be familiar with the history of it. So, for example, the Great Ideas Project is very valuable uh, in this. So, more context you have of the ideas that are behind what is going on, the better you are situated to actually think the next level. Um, so, that kind of history of uh, ideas, et cetera, is, is, is critical for that. Um, so absolutely, I will, I'll do something, something on that kind of, kind of something looking forward of saying, okay, what, what, what is possible? So something, something along those lines. Um, so now it's uh, Sunshine and Mike. Sunshine, go ahead. Hello. I didn't have, I didn't initially have a question of the group. The question presented encompasses all my curiosities. I think, um, I think I just learned a lot from you guys on the discussions. I, the only thing that I, I guess I would say I had before was just how collective, how collective language derives from maybe the concept of authors, um, mm -hmm. okay. authors being able to make their own words and then how that translates into slang and then how that um, weave his way into the mainstream, but the questions presented were good. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we'll deal with that when we look at kind of how uh, languages, uh, languages grow. Um, Mike, were oh, you able yeah. to come up with a question? Um, well, you asked me to boil everything I said down into one, maybe two questions. And, Please. Uh, um, in thinking about it, it expanded uh, better than boiled down. But uh, if I wanted a, a concept uh, to try and make it two questions, um, uh, how, how is reality, ideas, concepts, experiences, 
and feelings, even feelings stored in your mind that it makes such a difficult problem to translate those into words. And uh, the second question, if we're familiar with the second question, is how we translate uh, wor into words or in reality, action, uh, reality, words or mathematics or diagrams, but we really want to translate that into actionable intelligence or actions and how we do that translation as that's the purpose. And uh, uh, I, I also struggle with the fact that we, uh, in, the, in the 20s, somebody came up with entropy as a measure of data. Uh, and, uh, but uh, that assumed, but that really was going to binary data rather than quantum <laughs> data. And uh, how do you really get a measure of knowledge or uh, wisdom? Okay. So wonderful. I don't All know right. If that boiled it down into something you actionable that you <laughs> could use. I mean, or... uh, what, what, one of the things that I'm going to do is to um, I'm going to at least part of it. I'm going to focus. I'm going to do at least part of the meetup on kind of the cash value of uh, language or uh, kind of action value of language. You know how how does language help us in actually guiding our action. So as opposed sure. to just kind of input and kind of um, organizing of data that you're coming in, which is like an input, how does it, how does it facilitate output? Um, something like that. So that's, um, that's the plan. So, okay, uh, folks, uh, thank you very much. I, this is very rich. Um, uh, kind of currently the temporary list without kind of detailed processing of all the questions that I have are, you know, topics, that, these are the topics that I'm thinking of doing, kind of uh, focusing on uh, in upcoming meetups. Um, the first one is kind of evolution of language, kind of looking at, um, you know, how language came to be. So this will be just pure evolution. Uh, second one would be spoken versus written language. Uh, how did written language uh, come to be? What is the consequences of it? Currently, what's the difference between um, you writing something versus you speaking something, and what has how how is how is your mind improved by process of writing? Uh, the sec the next one would be uh, taking the general topic of literature, poetry, and seeing what we can learn from kind of mythology, literature, poetry. Uh, next one would be uh, what can you learn from science and mathematics? Um, so the, the, these are the ones. The next one is um, visual arts and music. Another one is growth of language. The great. Uh, the next one is uh, how do you improve your language? What can you do to be to kind of master language? Uh, then the issue of society and language, uh, kind of back and forth connection between society and language, power structures, um, the kinds of limits that language put on you uh, and uh, in society, vice versa. Um, next one would be kind of looking forward and saying, you know, uh, how do you how do you kind of foster curiosity, learning, uh, growth of language? And then last one was kind of action and language. So these are the kind of rough topics I have right now. And I will continue to organize that. So the next meetup is going to be on Wednesday at 9 p.m. Uh, on this topic. And I'm going to have my friend, uh, Robert Krasinski, who has written extensively and he knows a lot about language by using it day in and day out for several hours a day. Um, in written format, and I'm going to pose all kinds of questions. So it's going to be a conversation uh, with him, and I very highly recommend that. So that's going to be on Wednesday, and the next meetup on this series is going to be, um, you know, after that is going to be next Sunday, where I will organize these and come up with um, come up with something. Probably I'm thinking of doing kind of spoken versus written language um, uh, probably next Sunday, but I will all confirm that uh, very soon.